going to get started with the final panel. We've got to have a final panel because it's the final panel that gets people thinking about how they might uh, utilize uh, the services of our visual legal advocacy program. Um, it's the final session that has produced for us some real cases. Um, we did a a video for Hyas, which Margie Smith was involved in and she's going to talk about. Um, we are doing a couple of videos um, that were uh, given to us um, by Art Reed from Friends of the Farm Workers. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about, about videos, how videos might figure in the work that lawyers are doing and hopefully stimulate some uh, interest in uh, looking to us as a possible source of assistance with uh, producing a video for you. Um, so the first speaker is going to be Margie, uh, who is a partner of Think Tank Films and worked on the Sugiato Family Deferred Action application, uh, which she will show a part of. Uh, Mike Irely uh, is the Associate Dean for Communications at Penn Law School. And I thought you might find it interesting to hear from a communications uh, professional about uh, video and how video, or the existence of video and YouTube and iTunes, uh, is making a difference in the work that he does. Uh, we're going to give five minutes to Howard Blumenthal from uh, Mind TV. Um, hopefully we'll get to show a five-minute film, which was made from a, a larger film, and he can say five minutes about uh, about the format, uh, Mind TV being a possible outlet for something that you do. So, Margie, and I'm going to keep us uh, on track so that we can get out of here at 4 o'clock. Well, first, I'd like to thank Regina for asking me here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you that I think this is great work you're doing here. And, um, well, I've been working with video for almost as long as there has been portable, portable video. Um, I was using it in the 70s when I was an architecture student to do president, um, presentations for architecture school, and some of my teachers got it, some of my teachers didn't. And um, then I moved on to working in broadcast television in the 80s, and I've been doing that ever since. And um, that was the beginning of magazine format programming. So I have been working in magazine format programming ever since the beginning, essentially. I mean, there were, there were 60 minutes before the 80s, and then everything else took off. And, you know, so that's really become sort of a vernacular for people. And it, it's a, a language that people who look at visual media really understand. And, um, you know, so that's the format that I'm inclined to use. And I think it works really well. It's a, a combination of all documentary forms sort of rolled into one. And um, it's also, it allows for the uh, economy of filmmaking um, because sometimes we have to really distill reality when we're making documentaries just because of the time factors and the costs involved. Um, so, you know, one of the things I want to talk about today is manipulation of images and how we have to be careful in the way we manipulate images, especially in law, because um, I know attorneys are, you know, they want to represent their client, they want to win their case, and, um, you know, with visual media we can represent truth in so many different ways. You know, there are so many different truths and we can construct those truths using um, visual media. But first we have to understand, we have to understand how to deconstruct it. We have to understand the different elements involved when it's being made or we can't, we can't argue against a visual presentation and we can't create one on behalf of our own client. So I'm saying our, I'm not an attorney, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker, but I'm, on your behalf I'm speaking. So, um, well, one of the things is that, I mean, law and also education and academic circles have always followed significant changes in culture, and we were just talking about this yesterday, but it, the, these areas are lagging behind in using visual media for not only persuasion, but for education and for, um, 
uh, for learning and understanding. Um, and in law, pictures have been used as illustrations of words, but they haven't been used to create arguments and, and to, they haven't been used for persuasion. So for lawyers today, lawyers have to start thinking about how to rise to the new world that is unfolding before us because, um, you know, we're in un unchartered territory here. We've never communicated the way we do now. And I mean, in, in terms of outreach, in terms of who you can communicate with, and the tools that you have to communicate with, things are just so different now. And, you know, we're in, there's been a paradigm shift, and we have to start understanding what's going on. So especially for lawyers, you're talking to a new generation of people now who have been raised to use visual media. They're creating their own media. They're more comfortable with it. They acquire more knowledge from visual media. And they use visual references and all the things that those represent to them to make meaning. Um, and they're very comfortable with it, more so than they are with, with print now. But one thing that you really have to watch out for is that even though people who are from X and Y generations are used to consuming media, they're not used to thinking critically about it. And um, this is something that re people really need to be aware of in the legal profession. Um, Visual media has its own, vocab its own vocabulary. And, um, you know, in school we're taught all the elements of written expression. We're taught words, letters, syntax, sentences. But we're not taught the components of visual expression. And um, we're also not, we're not taught how to look at visual media in a way in, in which we can understand how it's been constructed. Like, um, um, for instance, I was talking to a class at Temple Law School just a few weeks ago, and one kid who was, you know, I think he was a, a junior in the journalism school, didn't understand that within any documentary that there was, some, that there was a human hand in creating the way the information was conveyed. I mean, you know, he, he, even though he had a journalism background, he didn't seem to understand that, um, you know, that this just wasn't truth. And this amazed me. It just amazed me. Um, I mean, you can look at the films of Frederick Weissman, for example, and, you know, I mean, that's the closest to conveying real-time truth, as you can see in documentary film. But few of us have the patience to actually sit through one of his films. You know, I mean, they're like six hours long, and they, um, you know, they, they're not the kind of distilled information that we see. They don't represent that information in, in the usual documentaries that um, we're used to seeing. So, I mean, for lawyers, I think it's necessary to understand that vocabulary and all those visual elements that make up visual media so that if you're presented with a visual argument, you understand how to respond appropriately to that. And also, if you're creating visual support for your own case, you've got to understand how to build that support. You need to understand how to use visual, um, visual media. So, the ways you would use this are um, in court for activity, activities of daily living videos, which many of you have seen. I mean, first of all, let me ask you, how many of you here are attorneys who have worked with video? Okay, very few of you. So, you know, there's a lot of resistance in the legal community to using visual media and also in academics. We were talking about that. Um, last night. 
And, um, you know, because it conveys a whole other level of information that you're not going to get strictly um, in an oral argument or um, in, uh, in a written, you know, anything that's um, written. Because, you know, you're getting a whole other level of nuance of expression um, that you're not going to see in, uh, in any other way. And out of court, um, you know, you can use videos in alternative dispute, dispute resolution to garner public support for a cause, as we've been talking about, and to pressure decision makers um, in certain circumstances. Um, and we're going to look at some of that in, in a little bit. So still images have a certain power. And, you know, we're looking here at certain images that, that we're all familiar with. And they all have a meaning that we bring to, the, to them. I mean, you know, they're not just literal images. They, all these images have meaning, personal meaning, cultural context that, you know, we bring to them. And um, what has been learned about the way we process visual images is that they, they, they skip over your verbal logic and go to a, a more actually primitive part of the brain which um, is less inclined to use logic to, to um, understand them. I mean, you know, there's a more, a more visceral response to visual images. And when we get into time-based media like video and film, that's going to have the greatest impact of all because you can add another element in there, which is the juxtaposition of images and the, the timing. You're able to control the way those things unfold. And, um, you know, those factors give you extra punch in delivering a message. Um, so there are also other con visual conventions that you can use. Lighting, camera angle, the way the camera moves, all these things support the message. And those things can be used either to support a message that you feel is, um, you know, worthy of support, or it can be used to manipulate. And, you know, so you have to be very careful of, of being manipulated, and you also don't want to manipulate. And I'm going to show you an example of one of the most powerful and manipulative examples. Now that made quite a splash. <laughs> that was seen once on broadcast television, and then it was pulled because um, it freaked people out. And um, after it was pulled, it was seen in its entirety on the evening news. Um, it was shown everywhere. You know, it was all over the tube at that point, and it was, and so many people have seen it to this day, even though it was only broadcast once. Um, now, you have two distinct images there. You have that little girl, and you have the atomic bomb exploding. This was released uh, less than two years after the Cuban Missile Crisis, so it, e it had even greater impact um, back then. And, um, you know, so people brought to that a lot of baggage. And uh, it was, um, you know, this is an example of what you don't want to do. 
<laughs> because it's so it's really over the top. I mean, and you don't want it. You don't want to be that heavy with your message, but you do want to rely on um, you know the. the, the what people bring to images, you want to keep that in mind when you're using your images for your uh, for legal videos. And um, when we, whoops, when we did this film for the uh, for the Sugianto family, they were. Uh, um, I'll just give you a brief background on this film. They were an Indonesian family, and Judy, help me out here. They were an Indo Indonesian family. I hate public speaking, by the way. You can probably tell. Um, they were an, Indo an Indo Indonesian family who were facing imminent detention and de deportation. Um, and they were just waiting for a knock on the door at any moment. They had exhausted every legal avenue. And um, they, they were out of options. So Judy Bernstein came here for the last round table thinking that, um, well, we might as well try one last-ditch effort to help them out. And um, so we made this film, and what happened was it was sent to Senator Casey, it was sent to Senator Specter, and evidently uh, they, they had the option of um, presenting a special bill on behalf of this family to buy them citizenship, right? And um, they didn't do that. But Casey's office did pass the film on to Immigration uh, and Customs Enforcement to the very person who had the ability to, uh, to help them out. And he called Casey's office and said, well, oh no, he called Steve Morley, right? One of the other attorneys on the case and said, is anybody going to see this film? Or are you going to show it publicly? And Steve Morley said, I don't know. And well, so they called the dogs off. And these folks, it bought them some time. They got up to the Canadian border. And they are now in Canada seeking asylum. Um, so it worked. And you know, when I approached this film, what I did, can I grab some water? There's uh, a new one right here. Okay, what I did was I went to ICE's website and I looked at the language that they use um, because I wanted to see how they wanted to present themselves to, um, you know, what, what they wanted their public face to be. And I looked at the language that they used and I started thinking about how we could counter that and really um, sort of smear their image to the public, you know, I mean, ha you know, how can we do that? How can we make them look like they're not such nice guys? They're not heroes. And um, so what we did was we looked at the family and we looked at who was supporting them. And they had a lot of support in the community. And they had two darling little girls who were just, um, you know, they were great. So we placed the family in the context of, um, you know, uh, trying to be Americans, wanting to be Americans, doing everything right. They're religious. We, got, we spoke to their, uh, their priest. They were active in the community. A lot of people depended on them, and we tried to present that. And we tried to, I tried to use language in the script that um, really countered the language that, that I see was using. And uh, I think we were successful in the effort. So what I'm going to do is show you just a section of the film. Soon after arriving in the United States on a tourist visa, the Sukiantos began the process of applying for asylum. They turned to a local Indonesian woman to help process their forms paying $1,500 for her services. She promised me that she will uh, file my asylum case. But after three or four months, I came to her again and asked about what, what, what did I get 
for the proof that you already filed my asylum case. And she told me that I already sent your application and everything. In fact, the promise was not fulfilled. The application, now outside the one-year deadline, was not considered. The Sukiantos now have two daughters, Nikita, who was born in Philadelphia, and Tasha. We saw a plant that smells like um, mint. Yeah. You wow. take off the bulk and then it smell like mint. Wow, it's cool. Yeah. It is through their girls that they find their greatest joy in spite of the hardships that they face. Oh, wow. Having daughters makes the prospect of returning to Indonesia all the more frightening. In the late riot in 1998, the victim of the, the big victim is riot is Chinese girls. They're being raped and they're being humiliated in, in front of crowd like that. Gilbert had missed breakfast and his stomach growled all the way to school. Tasha and Nikita are students at Independence Charter School, where they are both thriving. Tasha was selected to attend a special science program for gifted children at the University of Pennsylvania and has already received many academic awards. This is the Super Science Award, Effort and Science. This is my um, award for ballet. I took ballet when I was in kindergarten, and now I take hip-hop and cheerleading. The girls are very, just t at the top of all things academically. Henny and her husband and the girls are always there when there's volunteer efforts. If we need field trip parents, if we need uh, something to be donated, they're, they're just 100% participation all the time. In 2005, when the family's legal status fell into jeopardy, the school community rallied around them. Under the guidance of their principal, students, faculty, and parents took part in a letter-writing campaign. They eventually brought the effort out into the broader community with the goal of delivering a thousand letters each to Senators Specter and Santorum. We made over 2,000 notes at the end. And we also canvassed our neighborhood mm -hmm and our families, and many people were very interested in helping this family. We also went, um, we, we had uh, rallies outside of the Constitution Center, and we got signatures there from passerbys and told our story to the people that were um, walking by the Constitution Center. Yes, I, I've, I feel we made a valiant effort. It makes me think that it's just not fair, that we try so hard and it just doesn't work. The family that has touched so many lives at their daughter's school is equally as enmeshed in the life of their church, St. Thomas Aquinas in South Philadelphia. Henny is a stay-at-home mom. She takes care of her home and her family. And so she comes to daily mass, and I see Henny on a daily basis. But she herself in particular and the family in general are very active in the parish community. Henny is on the leadership team for the Indonesian community. Henny is particularly responsible for the religious education, which means she oversees all of the aspects of religious education for the children of the community in our parish and herself is even one of the teachers. And so she has a very responsible position and does a lot of work for the community in that position that she has. I'm the, I'm the first Sunday school teacher in Indonesian community. Before that, there is no Sunday school in Indonesian community. When my child went to independent charter school, uh, when I looked the curriculum, there is no religion. Uh, formal for them. That's why I, I asked Father Astanto why we don't have a Sunday school here so we still can teach the children about God. That's the basic for them I think for you know to get them know that we are just only human. There is a there is another thing above us that uh, can make us wise 
The Sukiantos have always been above ground and forthcoming about their plight. When their friends offered support, they accepted, but as a consequence were thrust into the spotlight. They have appeared in American media several times, which they fear would only complicate their situation if forced to return to Indonesia. Another friend who has offered a helping hand is Don Ong, whose son attended preschool with Tasha. I've told her that she can call me at any time. I've talked with my husband about it and what we can do and how we can help. And we've presented um, to Henny what you know our ability is in terms of helping her. Don prepared me to uh, think about that. What happened if the deportation order is come out and then they catch you or they catch your husband because it's, it's could happen any time. For the children who are already here, who have been here almost all their lives for Tasha and absolutely all uh, her life for Nikita, going back would be, to me, I think, a death sentence. Don told me maybe I can help you by adopt the bigger one because the bigger one is in danger too. She is, uh, Tasha is in my application. And then Don told me, maybe I can help you with adapt her. Um, and about Nikita, if, if something happened to us, maybe the government can have them. At, uh, and Don just only can have, a, just to be a foster, foster parent. So I don't know what happened to them too, because I'm not prepared for that. There are times when I see Tasha and Nikita come in and kind of almost be kind of sticking together, um, kind of looking, kind of tentative. There are times when they come in here and I really do feel that the tension in the family, you know, the kind of, it, when you feel like the knock on the door kind of thing is going to happen at any time, I think you become kind of timid when you're in larger circles, so I see that. Do you worry about possibility of going there? Yeah, I will be sometimes. Because it might be scary. How much of your time do you spend thinking about it? Do you spend a lot of time, a little time? A lot of time. Um, there was a time, you know, uh, that I really felt it was necessary for my, myself and the counselor to have a talk with Tasha and Nikita at the beginning of this year um, because it seemed imminent that they might just disappear in terms of the knock on the door coming and, and the agents, government agents coming to take them, um, that I felt that there had to be some kind of connection. So without kind of saying or scaring them, I kind of walked around it but talked about how important and how great it was to know them. And I'm going to get upset. <laughs> This family is such a great family and it contributes so much to everything in the United States that it seems wrong that they have to live day to day thinking that they or part of their family or something's going to happen or they're going to end up being put in jail somewhere. They have become a part of the community here. Their family has become a part, have intertwined their lives with people. Um, people in the school, their friends, their children's friends, for them to leave would create uh, a void in the lives of a number of people, but in a community as well. Kids are, are really kind of, not simplistic, but rather really pure kind of in their like understanding. And, and they don't see why there can't be an understanding about this family, why they can't understand, why a government can't understand that it's not safe to send someone to a country where kids are beheaded on their way to school. The people are sort of like more important than paperwork because, I mean, paperwork is paper and humans are like people. In the eight years since they first arrived, the Sukiantos have become friends, neighbors, teachers, and fixtures in their community. They have given of themselves in return for the opportunity to raise their family in peace. But anyway, um, you would have to be an ogre to not have some sympathy for these folks. And um, when uh, 
ICE saw this, they, uh, they backed down. And, you know, I think one of the most important things when you're working on a film like this is to, I mean, before you even begin work, is to decide who your audience is. Because, um, you know, I mean, we knew who we were going to be talking to with this film. And we started from the outset to speak to immigration. I mean, that was really what we did. We knew they were the ones. I mean, the, um, the senators, yeah, it would have been a better case scenario if they had sponsored a special bill. But we knew from the beginning that that was highly unlikely. And uh, so it was, um, you know, the secondary audience was ICE. And in either case, you know, we really wanted to elicit sympathy without going overboard. And, um, you know, it, it worked. But, you know, as you see with those juxtapositions, you know, how, how we strengthened the case that we, we didn't, I don't think we saw the video of the riot in Indonesia, but we used that also to the innocence of these kids as compared to the world that they might have to go back to. And it was, it's just such a stark visual contrast that it, it worked very well. Um, and also, you know, I feel that this form while it's a bit pedestrian to anybody who's really, you know, into filmmaking, it works in that it's very familiar. It's familiar to anybody who watches TV, who looks at mass media, and it's a language that they understand. And very often you're going to be presenting your films to a not very sophisticated audience. So it's best to speak in that language and, um, you know, that's what's going to speak to them. And because in law, it's my understanding that you're trying to persuade and influence people, and um, you know that's that's what you want to do, and you have the best interests of your client in your mind, and um, you know that's who you're advocating for. So, however, you want to do that and stay within your ethical bounds, um, you know that's really the way to go. Um, so. If you want to proceed and do a project like this, you know, I, I've spoken to lawyers, there's a lot of resistance in the legal community to using this medium. It's like, it's something new, it's um, an unknown, people aren't accustomed to it, people don't really understand all the elements involved, um, and it's a new kind of argumentation. Um, so it's a hard sell. But it's really very effective. And I think that, you know, given the way the world is, is going, I mean, again, as I said, I mean, there's definitely a paradigm shift now in the way people are communicating with each other. And I think that this is something that really needs to be incorporated into many facets of, um, of, our, our, of our culture now, law among them. Um, so can you do this yourself? Yes, I think that the real, the real thing that lawyers need to do is they need to understand how to communicate with filmmakers. Is when I was in architecture school, we had to learn engineering, and it wasn't because we were going to do, we were going to be structural engineers, but we had to understand how to communicate with engineers, and we had to understand structural engineering, because that's the backbone of what makes a building stand up, and it also needs to be incorporated into the design. So same thing here. As you're collecting material for your case, if you plan to go this route, you need to be thinking about the materials that you can acquire in the process. I mean, um, and you need to be asking yourself certain questions. Do I have a compelling story to tell that will translate into a linear film like this? Do I have compelling characters? Can they express themselves well? Because if they can't, um, you know, this might not be the way to go. You know, another thing to ask yourselves is, are they telegenic? You know, too bad you have to think about that, but if they can't express themselves well on video, if they don't look good, if they can't be understood when they speak, if you'll notice Henny's husband never said a word, well, 
it's because his English was very poor. And, you know, we didn't want immigration to see that this guy couldn't really speak English very well because that didn't, you know, that wouldn't have supported their, their case very well. Um, but we did have him sit there. We wanted to see them together. You know, it was very deliberate that he didn't speak. I mean, he did speak. We had a translator speaking into a boom mic off camera as he spoke, and then we decided not to use that bit because, you know, we felt that it would have hurt their case. And, um, you know, other questions you need to ask yourselves are, you know, um, what resources do I have available to me? If you're on a limited budget, are there things available locally? Are there elements, um, you know, that you can shoot that are local? Um, or is there video? Are there resources that you can get from elsewhere? Um, is, can you subpoena news footage? Maybe, you know, you can possibly use that. Still photographs. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you have to look at all the resources that are available to you. And um, then can you actually craft these things yourselves? You can. You can, just as you can build an extension on your house, if you've never done carpentry, you know, you can read a book and reinvent the wheel. Or you can go to these guys, <laughs> or, you know, people who are trained filmmakers, and you can, um, you know, work with a filmmaker. And, uh, but, you know, just learning what you need to learn. You'll have the vocabulary and you'll have the understanding of the process so that you can communicate with the filmmaker to craft um, a film that you can use to support your case. So um, I will now turn it back over to you. To you. Thank you. Uh, while Neil's getting the slides set up, let me just say that I'm, we've already got them set up, I'm an old school, uh, how do I advance these? You're going to hand me something, right? I'm an old school traditional print guy, and 25 years ago when Gannett Newspapers was launching USA Today and took out ads praising themselves for making their newspapers more visual and less verbal, I cut out the ad, wrote on it, don't let the bastards win, and hung it in my office. So you may wonder why am I here talking to you today? It's because the bastards won, okay? And, and so like everybody else, I'm trying to figure out how to make better use of images to persuade the audiences I'm trying to influence. Um, I think this is a, a terrific film, and when I first saw it, it, it occurred to me that the real power in it are the visuals of children on Christmas morning, birthday cake with candles, the little girl talking about hip hop and cheerleading. And I thought, there must be other people in our society who could benefit from some visuals that conveyed that they too are part of the American experience. That was the part of this whole film, right? So I thought, Here, here's a list of things I think we could all agree, readily agree, part of the American experience, right? So there we go, we got the kids on Christmas morning. We got some baseball, we got playing some basketball. Yes, you know where I'm going with this, right? At the beach. Okay, if you didn't know where I was going with this, you do now. Here you are to your grandparents. Those are the uh, terrorists he likes to pal around with, I guess. Uh, here are some politicians' Christmas cards, just from this past year. The Clinton's card, the Edwards card, the Obama's card. Daily Koss actually did a vote online who had the most presidential Christmas card. It was very close between John Edwards and Barack Obama. <laughs> they didn't like Hillary's card so much, okay? Um, I'm pointing this the wrong way. The point being, I don't know about you, this could look a lot like a, a family photo album from my family. Even so, Chris Matthews says it's hard for someone like Obama to express a gut sense of Americanism. And so I'm, I'm wondering to myself, what's going on here? Right? I mean, I found these photos just by going to Google image search and typing Barack Obama. So there, there must be a problem with distribution or with positioning, because clearly if you put these together and, and you package them the right way and you get them in the hands of your audience, that is Americana right there. Uh, so we've been wrestling with this here at the law school. So here are some representative images, what used to be on our website uh, un until we, we revised it in September. Uh, classic images for us, we're known as a collegial law school, right? 
Sample images from the Chicago Law School. Who would you think is the collegial <laughs> law school? Images convey a lot. Um, these are now representative of the images that are on the home page of our website. You know, completely different. What we do when these appear on the website is a little strategic message of text comes across when they pop up just to drive home the point we're trying to make with every image. But I mean, if all you're doing is looking at the image and, collect, uh, and connecting emotionally, you get something different. Uh, we've, we've launched a newsroom, and you can see lower left, I have a circled in red. Uh, there's actually video and audio on the web. We make that a prominent feature in the newsroom, and every time, well, almost every time, we post a video there, the upper red circle, I also post a story in the newsroom quick description about that video because by posting that story, the RSS feed catches it. So as we start promoting our newsroom and trying to get alumni and prospective students and admitted students to, to subscribe to our feeds, I want them to know every time we've posted a video what's there that they can go look at it. So we're, we're trying to drive that in two ways. We just announced an accelerated three-year JD MBA and of course that comes with the requisite news release announcement and the grid about how the curriculum works and all that text information. But what we also did was we sat Professor Ed Rockdown, who helped create this program, and interviewed him about it. We don't expect anybody who's interested in this, prog interested in this program to go to the website and watch 25 minutes of Ed Rock talking into a camera, right? So we've repackaged it. We came up with six questions, and we structured the interview more or, less, more or less like this, but we came up with six questions that somebody considering this program might be asking themselves, and we let them know right with the link how long they're going to have to sit and watch a video to get that answer, <laughs> right? Time is of the essence. Uh, we're also making better use of audio in addition to the video. Dean Mike Fitz gives a welcoming convocation address down at the National Constitution Center. Again, we've recorded that in audio, broken it into segments, so you can click on whichever part you'd like to hear. We have a special website for admitted students. One of the big competitive things among elite law schools is not only attracting the right applicants, it's when you've admitted students, you want them to pick you instead of Chicago, Harvard, Yale. Okay, so we have a special website that we use for students who have been offered admission. And this film strip here, what, what, one of the things we put there are short video interviews with all kinds of students. So this is just a, a, a sample. This is not all of them. You can readily go to this page, see somebody who looks like you, see somebody who doesn't look like you. You can click on it and you have somebody talk to you about what the experience of studying at Penn Law is like. What's it like to be a law student in Philadelphia? Um, you know, crime in Philadelphia has been in the news a lot off and on. We ask these kids to address that as part of the interview when they're talking into the camera. And it's, uh, this is Northwestern. Uh, whether it's been yourself or your children or whomever has been applying to undergraduate or graduate or professional school lately, you're, you're familiar with the traditional print view books, those big pieces that, that try and say, here's why you should come to Penn Law or wherever to study. Northwestern's view book is basically all online. The only thing they put in print anymore is a pretty small pamphlet. So when you go to this, there are all kinds of categories across the top. And, you get virtual tours and you get professors and the dean and students and alumni talking to you. It's completely video driven right now. Now, whether that makes sense for us, I don't know. Uh, lawyers tend to be text people and information people, not so much um, visual people in making the emotional connection. On the other hand, that's why we're all here, right? It's, it's, we gotta figure out how to make that transition. Uh, uh, this is uh, iTunes. Chicago Law School, this is audio, not video, but they post regularly lectures by prominent people that come into the law school to talk to them. Uh, Wikipedia, we're trying to pay real attention to Wikipedia right now. Uh, whether or not it's becoming more accurate, it's certainly becoming more authoritative, if that makes any sense. Well, I mean, <laughs> everybody's getting their impression from Wikipedia right now, so you, you know, you gotta pay attention to that. Are you editing that page yourself? We are. Are you? <laughs> we, <laughs> we actively pay attention to what's going on, and, and we try and do it. Yeah, the, the last thing we need is for somebody out there to say, oh, look at those PR people at Penn Law. They're, they're trying to game this. No, 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 no. We're just trying to make sure that what's there is accurate and correct things that aren't accurate. Um, 
same thing with Google. Uh, you, know, you can go into Google and go to panel all videos, and several of these on the left uh, are interviews with some of our professors, uh, and one's even the, uh, an opera company performance that the law school students put on a musical every year. You can see that on video. The university has a YouTube page, which is fairly recent, uh, at least trying to actively do something with it is fairly recent. We have to figure out what's an appropriate presence for us on the, the university's YouTube channel. Because if you go to YouTube and you type Penn Law, this is one of the videos you can see. Uh, I just want to point out ahead of time that the guy in the yellow headgear is an MBA student from the Wharton School. In a minute, you're about, about to see a student from the law school. So if you go to YouTube now and type in Penn Law, you'll get that kind of stuff. We ought to make sure that our messaging is there as well. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'd be happy to participate in a dialogue or answer any questions about how we're trying to use video to advance the messages of the law school. Now we've got five minutes from Mind TV, but we're going to show five minutes of Mind TV. You want me to set it up first? Uh, well, you can do that in two minutes. Okay. Um, Everything can be done in five minutes. That's true. <laughs> My name is Howard Blumenthal, and I'm the CEO of a new television channel. It's also a global internet channel called Mind TV. It's a little controversial because every single program is five minutes long. And what you're going to see on here is a very hard push against what contemporary media is all about. Um, we're taking on increasingly tough topics. We work within rules. Every rule that we use to judge a program is published on our website, which is mindtv.org. Um, and we actually evaluate every program only to see whether or not it follows the rules and allows us to keep our license. So what you're going to see is the first of a series called State of Mind. Um, it's a five-minute program produced by somebody who's just out of college, uh, who interned us with us for a while, and then afterwards I'll tell you a little more about it. In Philadelphia, roughly five people are shot every day. Consistently in the last few years, we've had anywhere between 1,500 shootings and 2,000 shootings each year. Unfortunately, this has become part of our, our culture here. So we have a culture of violence that exists in the most urban parts of our, our city. There are some systemic issues that just have the city's foot on the throats of our kids. And until we can lift that foot off their throats, we're just going to be hoping against hope, really. The Friends of Laurel Hill Cemetery have developed the Urban Mourning Project in response to the growing violence in Philadelphia, in particular how it affects children of the city. The expressions that we have in stone are just a different form of the same expression that people are making through the murals, through the teddy bear memorials. Mourning rituals are so important. All rituals are important. I mean, that's why we have marriages, that's why we have funerals, because the group support that happens in the ritual process, I think, is what's really important. In response to that, I was thinking that if we develop a program that we work with artists and grief counselors, go into the community, work with the children, and help them creatively express their grief in a constructive manner that maybe we would do one small thing to help break the cycle of violence. I've had so much loss recently that it really makes my heart happy to know that the Urban Morning Project is doing something like this in our community because I feel like people will begin to open up and I think silence is part of the problem. I don't think that there's a lot of opportunity for these kids to grieve. There's no grieving for the victims who survive, and certainly for those individuals who are killed, their families are required to go right back to the war zone. So it's, it's tough. Where we can really make a difference in children's lives is 
to give them a, a safe place to deal with their inner world of pain and loss and fear. Um, adults don't understand. They, sometimes they say, just get over it, he's gone. I heard when my brother got shot, it made me really mad. And I want to punch things when I get mad. Then I'm trying to get over it, but I still think of him. My dad got hit on a motorcycle accident on June 28th this summer, and my uncle got shot at a bar at August 20. My cousin Latoya was killed by a hit and run accident, and my cousin Cache was hit by, struck by a bullet by a drive by accident. When you ride by a memorial of someone who was shot and killed, and it gives their dates. You see these communities trying to tell the world that this person was important to us. Because Laurel Hill has this very rich history and has all of this beautiful landscape of iconography, we look at those traditions and that culture of people and make a relationship to what's happening now. The arts program will integrate grief counseling, introduction to historic and cross-cultural rituals. For example, the visual artist might build some kind of memorial remembrance with each child. Then they may work with a dance artist to think about where they are in relation to their memory. My sister, she likes to draw, she likes stuff like that, so she got a tattoo to resemble. Like me, I might write music about it because I do music, so I mean, that's how we help cope with like what was going on by getting shirts made, tattoos. If the kids can find that their experiences are useful to other people, then they become useful and they, they have a much bigger capacity to be generous. Even though we have other programs that have an anti-violence uh, prevention within their programs, they don't really deal with the grief process. So I think having the Urban Morning Project would be really unique. I think we're going to see some really good things out of our kids. I want it to be a place where children have maybe begun their social activism. We want to significantly decrease the violence in the communities that we serve. Uh, so very briefly, because I promised I would do this in five minutes, uh, the website where you can read about and watch every single five-minute program, there are about 600 of them now, um, is mindtv.org. The key here is that we as a broadcaster are skirting the very edge of, um, of an open forum. We have a responsibility to be a gatekeeper. You're probably all familiar with the difference in Supreme Court decision that kind of guided that. Uh, but we're really, we really believe that media ought to belong to the people, particularly public media. Uh, so we're creating a very different strain from PBS, a uh, very different strain from WHYY or any of the other public television stations. And yet this is a pretty big signal. It covers 12 counties now. We reach about 6 million people every day. Um, so it's a large size operation. And um, you know, pretty much um, what you're going to see on there is going to be a range from music to travel to serious, to not so serious. So this doesn't become the channel where it's like, oh my gosh, this is all so depressing. Instead, it's going to be intermixed, and it's going to be random, so that you may be living under a very serious topic next to one that's not so serious, which is more or less the way we live our lives. Um, and we'll produce it for you if you like, um, or you guys can produce it, or somebody else can produce it. We don't control that. We simply ask that you follow the rules, that you work within five minutes, and that you make a use of the resource, because this is an extraordinary resource. There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. Uh, we invented it here in Philly. We branded it here in Philly. We got about 20 people working up in Roxboro making this happen every day. Um, and right now, it's on about 100 hours a week on Channel 35. Uh, it will be on about 150 hours a week when we cut over to four channels, four digital channels in February. Whew, how did I do? Okay. Thank you all.
want to thank Mark and Margie and Howard for participating in the last panel. I want to thank all of you for sticking around till the end. Um, I hope we'll have another meeting next year and we'll talk about more interesting issues involving um, documentaries and the law. So thank you all for coming.